Well, hi, I am Ian Callum, and this is Cars and Culture with Jason Stein. It is so good to be reunited with my friend. It's been three and a half years. We were in a different, we're in a different continent, in a different city, talking design, but now you're part of Cars and Culture. Thank you, Ian, for being on the show. It's my pleasure. Life has changed a little bit, um, primarily in the fact that when I was doing some a little bit of digging into what your your new world looks like, I noticed that you were designing furniture, which yeah, I uh, was a bit of a departure. Tell me about that, Ian. Yeah, I started a business with some friends of mine called Callum. They wanted to use the name. I thought, fair enough. Uh, and But the reason for doing this was after I left Jaguar, effectively retiring from the car business, I wanted to design other things. We we're still going to do cars, but I wanted to use the opportunity to go and design other artifacts, objects, because primarily my, my trained as a product industrial designer. And although cars have been my world for 40 years, you know, I do always this passion just to design things. And, and so I started off with a, with a piece of furniture, a chair, a domestic chair. A lounge chair. A, a lounge chair, yes. And it was, you know, it was heavily um, um, inspired by the Eames chair. If you were to see it, you'd see the stool and the chair, and it's very kind of relaxing looking. We're actually building them as we speak. And uh, it was just good fun. And, and of course, you meet up against um, a whole lot of different criteria and, and building methods, and, and it's a learning curve. But, you know, you're never too old to learn. So it was, it was about learning how to do other things. Unfortunately, we didn't have to smash it against the wall at 30 miles an hour to make sure it was safe. <laughs> to make sure somebody could relief. sit in it. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, we just sit in it, you know, as long as make sure you don't fall over. But, but yeah, you know, it's a whole different bunch of rules, really, when you're designing other things. I'm even doing a, a coal box at the moment, which, again, has got a whole set of uh, criteria which you have to adhere to. So it's, it's a bit of fun. But it is stuff which I genuinely want to do. It's not just the sake of it. You miss the car business? Yeah, I do. I, I'm, uh, the first thing I miss is the kind of the camaraderie of, of being in a studio as big as we had, you know, at Jaguar. We had a great team. I miss that. I miss being able to talk to guys. And, uh, you know, I mean, I had hundreds of people working for me, but the, the core creative team is about 30 or 40. And they were my friends. I miss them. And I miss the interaction. Um, I do miss a little bit of the... Uh, uh, jaunting around the world and meeting people like yourself and going to events. Mm -hmm. I didn't think I would, but you know, the notion of getting on a long haul flight and uh, with a, with a speech to make and write and then get off the other end, as long as I get gin and tonic, I'm, you know, during that period is fine, but I kind of miss some of that, you know, I miss the buzz, but however, I'm making my own buzz now. So, so there'll be those occasions will occur again. I'm sure, you know, under my own, uh, my own flag. So we'll see. This this is Ian 2.0, as you said, Callum Design. And yeah. why, let me ask why, why you decided to leave the auto industry to do that. Well, one thing was, I mean, contractually, I couldn't go off and design other things while I was at Jaguar. That was part of the deal. I did ask a couple of times, was told no. Um, but also, I was 65 and it was time to retire. I'd done 20 years at Jaguar. I felt like I'd made the statement I wanted to make. Uh, we turned the company around to the company we know today. And uh, it was time to get off and do something new. And so the, I'd always wanted to work for myself. You know, I did a little bit of it when I was at TWR in the Tom Wilkinshaw days, but I was still working for Tom, but it was my own design studio. But I wanted to get back to that sense of freedom and autonomy. And uh, it was, uh, and it's challenging. It's not easy, but you just have this notion when you get up in the morning, it's, you know, it's for me. It's not for the corporation which is actually quite liberating, to be honest. You're looking in the mirror and you're seeing the boss. I'm seeing the boss, yes. I'm also seeing a guy that has to keep 25 mouths fed and mortgages, <laughs> uh, you know, moving on. But hey, it's I, I don't worry about these things. I think you get to a point in life where there's no point in worrying about, about very much. You just have to get on and deal with it. And that's a nice one of the nice things of getting older is that's a point of view that you take on board. Um, with, uh, you know, with a sense of optimism. When, when, you, when you reflect back on your career, especially the, the, the last 20 years, what are you most proud of? What, what, what impact did you make, do you feel? <laughs> Good question. You'd have to ask somebody else that, I think. Um, what I'm most proud of, well, I always loved Jaguar ever since I was a very young kid, you know, and there's a story about how I 
I wrote to them when I was a teenager and everything. And I feel very privileged that eventually I found myself, you know, running and owning custodian of the design department. But I, I love Jagger to the point that I remember what it used to be in the 60s. It was a cool brand. It was a very modern brand, actually, very British, when you could actually have demarcation between nationalities of cars. It's very difficult now to do that. But, but it was still a very modern and, and, and almost revolutionary in many ways. And I wanted to get Jaguar back to that state of mind, you know, because when I joined it, it turned into quite a kind of retro type of vehicle um, car company where, where most things were reflecting the past and ye old England and all that stuff. And this is not what Lions wanted to do. I knew that. And so I set about with, with a good team to try and change that and bring Jaguar, albeit kicking and screaming sometimes, into the 21st century. And it was a long haul. It, it really was, and it took a lot of energy and a lot of effort. And, and believe you me, there were times that I thought, oh, is, it, is, this really, is this really worth doing? But, you know, we, we followed through. I had some good friends that worked with me and kept my strength going. And so what I'm most proud of is the fact that we did change Jaguar. You know, it is not the old man's car it used to be. It's a, a very up-to-date car company now, and, um, and the design of it reflects that. Is there anything that you didn't get a chance to do that you really wanted to accomplish when you think about your pulling the brand into a new era? Well, we were on the next generation of um, electric cars. You know, the I-Pace, you probably know, is the first electric Jaguar. It's probably one of the first cars of its type in Europe, which, which sure. was a real coup for us. It was, it, was, it was great, and we really pulled it off. And I was looking forward to getting that momentum going and then turning Jaguar into a really kind of avant-garde um, electric car company, which, which I saw coming. And unfortunately, I left before that kind of materialized. We had a few politics that we had to deal with. And, and it wasn't quite as I'd hoped, um, you know. So, and also, uh, you know, I'm also very self-critical. And I think you have to be as a designer, you have to look at what you've done and, and be as objective about it as possible. And perhaps in one of the last two, apart from my pace, one of the last two or three cars that we worked on, I wish I'd been a little bit more um, out there and, and done something uh, which, which would have been seen as being uh, of the same modernity as the XJ was when it came out. And I don't think we quite got there. And part of the reason was we actually listened to the marketing guys. They told us, guys, stop being so, so radical. Do something more in keeping with the rest of the, the bunch, the BMWs and the Mercedes. You know, the package wise, we've got to get somebody six foot five in the back, really. No, I don't know, I listen too much. And, <laughs> and, and um, I'm sure Dutch would probably agree with that. But, I'm you sure know, I, I, I listen too much to the needs and wants, the practical side of it, and the, and the comparisons we've been made against BMW and Mercedes. And I shouldn't have done that. I should have gone out and done what was right for Jaguar 100%. So a few little, you know, moments there that perhaps I could have been stronger on. But overall, I'm very happy with what we did. I don't know what's going to happen now. It's all change again. So let's wait and see. Being self-critical, you mentioned a minute ago, are designers kind of maniacally critical anyway? Do they always question themselves? I mean, I, something I can always some. be better, I, right, Ian? <laughs> things can always be better. Of course they can. And, you know, I, but I, I say to my team, you know, you got this young team, they go and look at something that they've spent three or four weeks on. And we look at a car and I say, guys, just imagine you haven't done this car. Now, what do you think of it? And I learned that working at TWR because I was on my own. I learned to be absolutely self-critical and to be honest with myself. I don't think a lot of designers are that self-critical, to be honest. I, you know, mm. I think it's very, and I, I, I've, I've been guilty of it too. Once you put something down into 3D and it's taking so much effort, you become quite self-satisfied and that's always dangerous. And um, I look at cars on the road nowadays and I think, yeah, they became too satisfied too quickly in some of those cars, you know, they'd been playing with a clay model and they didn't know where to stop. And, and um, their bosses said, you know, you've got one line too many and, well, they haven't said that. They should have said it. And so I, I'm not, I'm not so convinced. I think designers can be very critical of others, but I'm not always convinced they're critical themselves. Yeah, it's interesting. I want to go back to that 14-year-old boy who wrote the <laughs> letter to, was it, was it Bill Haynes? Is that who you wrote it to? It was to Bill Haynes, the chief engineer. Yeah, he was vice president of the company, effectively, chief engineer. You were a boy who um, used to read a lot of magazines that came to the home, and your grandfather used to get Life magazine. 
And you mm-hmm. reacted to a gray metallic E-type coupe on the back cover that encouraged you to go and see the car in an Edinburgh showroom, if I'm correct. That's correct, yes. And you said, and and it led to a, a letter to Bill, but you also said that if it if you hadn't seen that E-type in the magazine that day, I'm not sure life would have ever been the same. No, it had a, and this is something I'm acutely aware of. If you capture people at a young enough age that you can affect their their view in life quite um, quite incredibly. And I saw this car, I fell in love with it. I thought the future had landed, you know, it looked like a spaceship. <laughs> and, and I knew I wanted to have something to do with cars, but this cemented it for me. And and also the whole Jaguar brand as well. I wasn't hugely aware of it. I was only seven or eight years old. But um, yeah, it just captures something. The, the, the romance of it, uh, the exoticness of it, everything that um, I was kind of searching for in life was there on that page. And so I went to look at one at a garage showroom not far away from my grandfather's house. And there it was, a red E-type coupe. And I just thought, wow, that's something <laughs> else. And, you know, and it just, and you know, if you capture somebody at that age, capture their imagination, uh, you can really influence the rest of your life, the rest of their life. And, and it did do that, absolutely. Would and also be a believer in, in, in trying to, and try to instill that and in, in people who teach and, and educate you know you don't capture kids at the age of 16 or 17 or 18 you capture at the age of 10 and 11 12 when they're still young enough to be perhaps naively influenced but influenced and also to to start creating a kind of a direction and an opinion and your father wasn't even a car guy but in 1960 yeah. he brings home a pre-war standard flying 10 which nobody in North America will even know what it is. <laughs> but you said that it, its arrival was a source of fascination for me. And you were already drawing a lot of cars. And you were fascinated by the curves on that standard flying 10, the front wings, right? Yeah, and you'd yes. climb on top and you'd slide down the car. Yeah, and your father, your yeah. father never, didn't Where like Where are you getting this stuff? <laughs> this is good. This is true. Absolutely true. Right? Yeah. Yeah. But you were fascinated. You were fascinated by car design. You were, you were, you were hooked. I, I was hooked. Well, I started off drawing things around the house when I was very young. This is preschool age. Mm-hmm. I was drawing Hoovers. And I can say Hoovers because it was a Hoover. It wasn't a Dyson or anything. It was really a Hoover. <laughs> it was a Hoover. And, and um, I was drawing this thing. I started when we got a television. I remember the first television arriving. So I started to draw that. I drew the radio and, and I, anything that was sort of mechanical. And of course, uh, then I discovered this Porsche 356 drove past. And I thought, well, that's interesting. It didn't have such a profound effect to me as the E-Type did because it just went past quickly. And, and by the way, this would be a brand new one. So that's how long ago this was. Mm. And I thought, that's, that's a car. That, that's a car worth noting. So something clicked to me again about wanting to be a car designer. Um, I just love drawing things and, and emulating what I saw in front of me. So... I, I decided at a very young age that I wanted to design cars or have something to do with them. Uh, my father's standard, I, I used to look at the, the wing, the fenders, you guys call them, with the wings in the front. And then I was just became so aware of the shape of them. They weren't just straight lines, they were curves. And uh, the shape of them was something that uh, really, really got to me. And of course, car design is all about sculpture, really. It's all about understanding form and proportion and all that good stuff. So that that was that was in, that that sort of started to build inside me, you know, from a very young age, this sense of something that is very three dimensional. And you end up working for Ford first. I, I did. I was very fortunate. I was sponsored at the Royal College of Art. I went to Ford in, in Essex in England, and uh, I was there for 10, 11 years. Uh, and during that time, I was able to travel and work abroad in Japan, Italy, and uh, the U.S. Um, in Australia and so I, they were very good to me at Ford. An interesting thing about Ford is that you really learn, the not the art but the, the technicalities of designing a car, especially to a cost as you can imagine and you know you really learn the sort of the, 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 the real ins and outs the nitty gritty of designing a car and by that what I mean is you create something and you have to see it through to reality it's all very well just drawing something and, and, and dream up an idea, but bring it to reality, especially in a company like Ford, is, is, is quite a demanding task. And you learn a lot 
So it's a great place for an apprenticeship. And if you look at a lot of many, many designers around the world who have gone on to, to run other design teams and other car corporations, they've often started at Ford. You go from there after 11 years in a corporate environment. And in 1990, you joined Peter Stevens, Tom Walkinshaw to form TWR Design. And yeah, well, actually, Peter, Peter just left at that point. He was really brought me in to replace, replace himself. So I, I kind of, by the time I got there, Peter had already gone to design something called the McLaren F1. You may, you may have heard of it. <laughs> I might, I might um, know that one. <laughs> and, uh, and so he kind of left me on my own to, to run this TWR design business. And the thing about Tom Walkinshaw was he realized that design was a shop window to business, especially in the car world. And, and yes, he had an engineering business, he had a motor racing business, but if he wanted to bring clients in to work with them, he also realized he needed to be involved in design and designers. Um, that was the, that was the kind of the hook really. And that's why he wanted me there. And I got on, in fact, I'm just writing a piece about Tom now and reflecting on some of the anecdotal moments I had with him, but, um, a remarkable character and he really understood design and the value of it and he gave me carte blanche you know he said just go out and do whatever you have to do smoke whatever you have to smoke drink whatever you have to drink just be creative and um it, wow, it was, what it an opportunity amazing experience amazing experience you know it is, um, it's funny you said you, you had walked away from a giant studio in <laughs> Dunton and the corporation, all those things into a little tin shed <laughs> that TWR uh, was, was working out of. You, you said at the time, I, I, I thought I was utterly mad, but you were happy as you could be. And lo and behold, you get your hands on the project, being involved in the Aston Martin DB7, which, as you described, truly a make or break product for what was then a very beleaguered firm. You said you couldn't have been more lucky than that but terrified you were. Yeah, I was very lucky. I mean, you know, I had a chance to design a car on my own. You know, this wasn't a team of three, 10, 15 people. This was me and, and the clay modelers. And I had one of the designer there. I brought in Neil Simpson, who worked in the interior. But yeah, it was daunting. And I, I had to work this thing on my own. I'd never done this before. And it, it was actually quite terrifying. But I knew that if I got this to work, it could be the making of me, which it was. Mm. But oh, I had sleepless nights. I tell you, we, we, I couldn't get things to work. I couldn't get the rear three quarters to work. I couldn't get the proportions to work. And then I suddenly realized, Ian, you know nothing. You've really got to step up to the plate here and start learning a few things. And my whole life's been like that. You know, I've always put myself out into the edge of things, even with Jaguar and, and, and the various aspects of working back in corporations. And and uh, I've stuck my neck out and, and tested my, my own metal and, 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 and so many times without really realizing it um, because I wanted to get to a certain place. So you had to do it, you know, and I've always been, I've always been very um, ambitious, but ambitious you can read in so many ways. I mean, a lot of people are politically ambitious. A lot of people are materialistically ambitious. They want to make lots, lots of money. But I was just creatively ambitious. I just wanted to be that guy that created something better than everybody else. That was my ambition. Uh, anything else that came along with it was a bonus. It wasn't what I was looking for. And of course, you know, the, the, the thing with being in TWR designing this Aston Martin was the only thing that mattered was my creative ability. There was nothing else to deal with. It weren't the politics. Actually, there were some politics with the outside businesses, but Tom dealt with that. I didn't. And so uh, I was very fortunate that I, I only had myself to, to make judgment against and get on with it. And that's where I learned to be self-critical because nobody else was going to tell me. And uh, I remember Tom used to come and look at the car and he said, you pleased yet? <laughs> that was very, very Scottish, by the way. So that's one of the reasons why we got on well together. But and I said, not yet. So I'll come back when you're finished then. And he'd come back a week later and say, you pleased yet? <laughs> <laughs> and and it was it was it was quite amusing, but I knew what he meant by it. You know, he was not going to be happy until I was happy, and that that taught me that uh, you know you have to you have to really look at what you've done and and make sure it's right. Well, and the rest was history. On the DB7, it became a towering success, and and some would say saved the company uh, to some extent. And um, I like to think so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Let's talk about uh, your your brother, 
um, is also a designer. Who followed who and who has the keener eye? Oh my goodness, that's a loaded question. Um, <laughs> Murray is probably a more pragmatic designer than I am, although I'm fairly fairly functional in what I do. Um, I, I started off, Murray, Murray, my brother Murray, he went into architecture. And then one day while going through his course in, in, in architecture in Edinburgh, and I was at Glasgow, he came and saw what I was doing and I was doing product design. And he decided at that point he would rather draw cars than houses. So then he jumped into the industrial design world and he ended up with a placement at the Chrysler Studio in Coventry. In fact, the same studio that was then bought by Jaguar that I actually ended up running. So we both worked in the same place at different times. But um, uh, I don't know who's got the keener eyes. Definitely got a, a, probably a more structured view of how he puts cars together than I do. Uh, but if that's a question you'd have to ask somebody else. <laughs> Is there any kind of fraternal competition between the two of you? None at all. No. None at only all. the cars. Only the cars we buy. Okay. You know, <laughs> well, there has to be some him, element. <laughs> yeah. Well, he's beating me about three to one at the moment. But um, uh, when we're together, we never talk to work. He would come in and say, "That jag you done. That's all right. Not bad job. Well done. That'd be it. Very dry." Yeah, but we are Scottish after all. We're not going to be uh, getting into the finite elements of the artistry of anything. It's just, how are you doing? How are you doing? What have you bought? And then you show me pictures of your latest Butte Riviera or whatever he's got, you know, so very matter of fact. Are you a designer or are you a stylist? Uh, uh, I'm a designer because I've learned to be designer. Um uh, because I take all the facts, I, I, I kind of wrap them up and put them in the back of my mind. I know they're there. And then I try and be as creative as possible. I encourage my team to do work the same way. And then I take on board all the facts that I have to deal with and, and, uh, and try to protect the original idea, but building the, building the facts. And I like to know how things work. And uh, if you don't know how things work, you can't design a car. Because otherwise, your naivety can get you so far, but then it will come to, it'll come to stop. And on that stop, you, the, you, you can't, without bending or, or compromising, you won't move forward. But if you, deal, if you deal with the facts to begin with, or at least have them there you know, in front of you, you know how to deal with them. And you don't come to stop because you work your way around them or you negotiate before you reach the barrier. So I think that's what designers do. They're about problem solving. It's not just about shape. Um, I mean, making the shape you want is problem solving because something will tell you you can't make it. But it is basically about problem solving. And that's what good design is about. That's what I was trained to do. And, uh, you know, and, and, and to be as creative in that problem solving as, as much as possible. So I, I, do, I do think I'm a designer with a capital D. Hmm. Simple design is elegant. Ian, but so difficult to achieve. Why is well, that? Well, you know, you, you write stuff, you do this stuff, you know, you do creative stuff. You know that if you want something to look like it was easy, it never was. You know, if you're writing a piece and it looks simple, it's easy to read, it gets all the facts out in front of you. Um, it looks simple, but it usually takes a lot of editing. And design is about editing, of course. So the simplest things to look at, the most beautiful things to look at are usually the simplest they're often the most difficult to achieve because you have to, again, you have to be ruthless in what you're looking at. You know, do you need that line there? Do you need that fold there? Do you need, uh, do you need the, um, the practicality of that roof line? Well, it's a jag. The answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not a good enough answer because you've got to go back and negotiate why you want to do it with 50 other people who are telling you it has to be that way. Um, so... Yeah, simple things, beautiful things take a long time. Why does design... Like poetry, you know? Yeah. The best poetry, the most eloquent poetry takes the longest. Yeah. Why does design resonate with consumers? Because they see it first. Yeah. You know, they, 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 you have to get people into a car before they'll even consider it. And, and I think, I don't think it's that important for everybody I'm discovering. You know, often the brand and the badging can be more important sometimes, which is hugely frustrating, unless you work for BMW or Mercedes. But, um, <laughs> you know, for 
to get a guy somebody into a Jaguar, you you have to you have to seduce them into it, and then they discover what a great car it is, and they really are great cars. Uh, but you know, imagery and everything in the modern day of branding, and I hate that notion of branding, but it's there and we live with it. Um, it's something you have to get over, and you have to seduce people into the car through its the way it looks, you know, the way it the way it dresses you. And my my somebody once asked me, "What's your metric for success?" You know, the metric boys would come out at Jaguar and, and say, right, what are your metrics, Ian? Well, you measure my metrics when you start selling cars, but it's probably a bit late then. But my <laughs> personal metric is, is when somebody buys a Jaguar and they've done a hard day's work and they open the front door and before they actually walk in, they turn around and look at the car and smile. Yeah. Yeah. I think I deserve that. That to me is a real metric. That's an emotional metric, but that's what it's about. It's an emotional, it's an emotional factor. And, and cars have this with people, often sometimes more than buildings and, and, and architecture. You know, and um, of course we're getting to the world where the cars has become a commodity, but in, in, in so many the latest generation of, of purchasers, it's just it's more about the, the functions and the uh, it's communication applications and all that stuff, but you know, it, it should still be an emotional purchase. Now that you've stepped out of design, at least daily automotive design to some extent, what's your opinion on contemporary car design? Well, I'm frustrated, really. It's a bit of a mess, isn't it? I, I, I think there's a lot of stuff out there I certainly don't like. It, it seems very confused and I look at cars and I, I say, you know, that's a nice piece and that's a nice piece and that's a nice piece, but not in the same car, you know, keep, and I used to Frank say to Stevenson team, said the same thing, you know, there's so many bits and pieces of cars nowadays. And it's like, you let the kids free in the sandpit and this is what they come up with. That's been very critical and quite harsh, but, and people that are quite, quite entitled to, to disagree with me, you know, there's this sort of, bits of design that's going on a lot of younger people seem to enjoy maybe i'm just getting old but it's not beautiful and that's a fact and time will show you that it's not beautiful you know it'll you look back in 10 years then well that baroque area i'm glad that's over with but uh, but maybe i'm just getting old who knows <laughs> is there anything out there that you like that 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 catches oh, yeah. your eye? yeah yeah there what are do you some like? things probably probably the minority i, I I like the, the. I've always liked what Volkswagen do because they're very disciplined. I look at a design, I can see that's that's knowledgeable, that's knowing. The people have done that. They they have a knowing, the understanding, and Volkswagen have always done that. Uh, I like to think JLR collectively have always done that. Um, Ford have been a bit up and down. Latterly, I'd have to say, of course, have been quite good because um, my brother was in charge. Uh, but. Um, uh, I, I love Porsches. I've been quite open about that. The two brands in my life have always been Jaguar and Porsche. Um, I think uh, I think well, Michael Maher is still there. I think he's what he's doing with well, 992. I think it's a beautiful piece of, mm -hmm. of form. 991 was nice. 997 was good. I have a 993 myself, which is probably one of the nicest in my mind um, because of its size as much as anything else. But I like what Porsche, I like what Audi is doing. Now, it's interesting if you look at that latest Audi E something, the the one that they've probably built on the Etron, Etron, the one that's built on the sports one, the coupe one. Um, it's a very elegant car. The proportions are fantastic. It is quite bitsa. There's a lot going on, but they've done it in a way which is knowledgeable, where it's it's controlled, where one bit relates to another, as opposed to some cars out there where two bits don't relate to anything. You know. And that's just something I see in cars. How will electrification change design? And it, can it change it enough? Or are there opportunities that are, that are out there? And you mentioned uh, the electrification of the JAG lineup. I, what are your thoughts on where it, where it goes? Well, when we did the I-PACE, I, I, you know, I was jumping with joy because I saw a huge opportunity there because you know it's, it's two motors sitting low down and everything else is joined by wires. So... And, and I think the Tesla demonstrates this beautifully as well. You know, you can you can put things where you want them. They're not joined by gearboxes and drive shafts and all that other good stuff. So there was opportunity. And for that, we, we managed to make the car cab forward. We could put the people more or less where we wanted. You still need some crash requirements for the front, which is getting tougher, incidentally, which may be a more 
of a, a defining fact than, than the opportunity to use a skateboard. Um, but I'm kind of disappointed, you know, we did it with the eyepiece. It's clearly quite a different shape from other Jags um, and other cars, I think. But all the, the stream of cars that have come since then, the electric ones seem to be fairly conventional. And I wish they'd use the opportunity to make them a little bit more different uh, because they could. Uh, the Volkswagen to a degree have done. The Mercedes electric cars don't look any different from an internal combustion engine car or indeed the BMWs. So that surprises me. Um, having said that, I know crash requirements are becoming tougher. So the idea of having a hood or a bonnet is going to be fairly essential. But I think there's opportunity. I, I hope designers push hard enough to, to, to use that opportunity to, 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 to get something different out at the end. Um, but basically, people say, why didn't cars become completely different? Well, for as long as we have eyes in our head and, and feet at the bottom of our legs, cars will be the shape they are because they're designed around human beings. You know, you have to see at the top and your feet at the bottom, and that's how you sit down. That's how cars are designed. They're designed around people, really. But electrification gives you a chance to move components around more. And so I'm hoping designers use that opportunity, yes. You mentioned Tesla a moment ago. I have to ask you the question. You said once that Elon Musk offered you a job. Is that true? Yeah, he did. Yeah. And when was that? that? You know, that was probably more than 10 years ago now. I mean, he was charming about it. And I said, I thought, long, thought, I thought long and hard about it. I might be very wealthy now for taking it, but that's, that was never <laughs> my motive. And I think he realized that. Now, I was about to, to finish off the XJ, uh, the car that no longer, of course, is. But, and I was so, I was so engrossed in, in getting this car finished. That's what mattered to me. So I, I didn't take the job. But I would love to have worked for him and that company and, and, and what did work in California. But uh, I had other things to do. And at the time, they were more important to me. Did he just reach out to you and say, I, I like what you do. How would you come and work for Tesla? Yeah, he did. He saw the XF. He told me he liked the shape of the XF. He, he could see that at last as a clean design, modern car. And, he, you know, I spoke to him about it. He fully got it. When other people weren't getting it, you know, they just said, well, because trouble, many people confuse clean and simple with boring. And it, it, it certainly it wasn't, in my mind, boring, but... He got the XF. He, he thought it was a super car, super looking car. And so, so he, he approached me. He's an interesting individual. Flattered. Yeah. 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 I had a bit of time with him. He was, uh, he was good company. I liked him. Yeah. Excellent. But I've never worked for him, of course. So, <laughs> right. <laughs> There's a long list of others who might be on that list. Um, l let's talk about some other, I would say, consumer products that you admire. Yeah. Let's say some, some, some favorite pieces out of different parts of the world. How about a watch? What are your, some of your favorite designed watches? Well, I have an association with Bremont watches. We do quite a bit of work with them, um, not designing so much as mutual PR work. Um, and Bremont are a, a British company, as you might know, and they, they build entirely in Britain, by the way. They're not built in Switzerland, even the, even the, the mechanics of them are built now in, in the UK. Um, so I really like the Bremont watches. They're quite, um, uh, they're quite traditional in many ways. They're meant to be. Um, they've got some lovely mechanisms which are just enthralling. Um, but generally, I've never been into branding and watches, or indeed anything. I tend to like very simple, pure design, uh, like Skagen watches. Is that how you pronounce it? Skagen, Skagen. The Dutch, the Danish mm -hmm. company. Sure. And if you're going to talk about style and, and aesthetic, they'd be probably amongst my favorites. And if you get into these multi-thousand-dollar watches, you see people wearing, you know, a little bit of chintz on them. They do nothing for me. Absolutely mm. nothing. You might, you might have a fancy name on the on the face, but uh, you know, they might be beautifully made. And the craftsmanship might be wonderful, but I can't get beyond, you know, a slightly, I don't know, um, untidy look of them. Yeah. So I'm always defaulting to the, the, the pure and simple. Simplicity. How about shoes? Um, I, do you know, I bought a pair of trainers for the first time about two or three years ago. I know everybody wears them because I always thought they were very inelegant things. And I think some, most of them still are, actually. They're very clunky looking things. But, uh, you know, my, I, I buy my shoes. Um, um, I can't remember the name of the company now. 
but they're British made shoes I buy, Italian mm-hmm. design British made and um, fairly eclectic mix, but I do love shoes. I buy lots of shoes and I probably got more shoes than my partner has. <laughs> She's got lots. So uh, I, I'm just, I've got that. It's, it's a three dimensional thing again, isn't it? Yes, it is. It is. What about a home? Thing. What about a home appliance? Um, simple stuff. Again, I will buy an aesthetic, you know, it quite often tends to be German, but, uh, we'll, we'll, you know, that's, that's kind of where that goes. Um, I'm, I'm terrible with names. I can't remember the names. That's, that's how indifferent I am towards brands. I think that's a, that's a Bosch or, a, um, yeah, has that kind of German appeal to it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, I've got Bosch kettle and toaster. Sure. And all that. Sure. Motorcycle. You're probably going to laugh at this, but I, I love American culture motorcycle. I love choppers and bobbers. <laughs> I don't know. There's something just so radical about them. Um, but if it's going to be a motorbike, it has to be a Ducati. Yeah. Yeah. You know, aesthetically, if it's going to be a proper, I, you know, street bike. It's I had a, a scrambler for a little while. Yeah. The, the new Ducatis one. are just simply beautiful things. Beautiful. Beautiful. They really are. So, you know, a Ducati monster is something I would quite happily have in my living room, as many yep. people do. Yes. I'm not allowed, though. I've got my hot rod in the living room. <laughs> um, you can see it behind me, actually. Yes, I can. Yes. What is that? It's a 32 Ford. A 32 Ford of a Ford Model yeah. B. It's a Ford Model B. Yeah. It's a three window juice coupe. Yeah. Wow. What, what else? California culture. What else do you have in your collection? I, uh, obviously, you, you have a, <laughs> nine, a 993, you mentioned earlier, but um, Aston Martin? I have a Vanquish. Yeah, a Vanquish S, because I never owned a car that I'd actually designed. So I went out and bought it. Uh, it cost a lot of money. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering whether it's a good idea or not. But, but uh, yeah, I have, a, I have an Aston Martin Vanquish, the first one. Um, Vanquish S. Like, yeah, Vanquish S, yeah. Mm-hmm. And my cars tend not to be that exotic. They tend to be cars that I wanted when I was younger. I've got a couple of minis, classic minis. I've got a Triumph TR6, which I know you guys in the States uh, will remember fondly when they worked. Early Uh, 70s, yeah. Early 70s, yeah. Um, Perfect for a sunny day. It is. It's a lovely car to drive. I I love it. Um, I've got a a Beetle convertible, uh, an old old one, an old classic one. And, you know, I've got an Alfa Romeo Giulia GTB. It's very Italian. And a BMW 6 Series CSI 1980s one. Wow. Anything that you want that you don't have? Yeah, Ferrari 250 short wheelbase. Okay. (laughs) That didn't take long for you to answer. (laughs) No, that's my favorite car. And I just love the shape of it. I always have done, ever since I was a youngster. Unfortunately, they're worth starting about $10 million now. So I don't think it's something I'm going to be rushing out to buy. We had Frank Stevenson on the show, and uh, we, we did a little experiment with him. We had a bit of a rapid-fire critique of design. And uh, the fact that we have Ian Callum now in our presence, I want to do the same thing. And then well, what we'll do is we'll compare answers. <laughs> okay. Just one word, one word to describe the following vehicles, if I may. Chevrolet C8 Corvette. Fussy. Fussy. Okay. Mm. Ford GT. Dramatic. Mm. Chrysler or Dodge Viper. Aggressive. Tesla Model S. Elegant. Anything from Koenigsegg. Over the top. That's three words, isn't it? Yeah, over Over the the top. top. (laughs) Stick them together. You're right. <laughs> Rivian R1T. Do you know I'm not familiar with that? The Rivian truck that's coming out. Yeah. Uh, interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Yes. No, I have seen that. I'm trying. I'm going through my memory banks. Yes. Sure. I remember it now. Yeah. Volkswagen ID Buzz. Lovely. Okay. Finally, uh, Toyota Prius. No. Oh, what fun. 
do, do you believe that design can and should telegraph a car's capabilities? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It should telegraph the car, the company, the brand that is, or the mark. I like the word mark. It's much nicer, isn't it? And, and the customer, the people who are in it. It should telegraph all these things. And that's, that's something I was very aware of when I was designing a Jaguar. Yeah. When we think about where the, the future is headed, Ian, and there's a lot of talk, obviously, of <laughs> autonomous vehicles, will designers be able to design in some semblance of automotive sexiness when those vehicles are autonomous? And I, and I guess the bigger question is, how can a car company differentiate itself from others when cars become little more than perhaps transportation modules? Well, I think there's two parts to this. You know, I think the car industry will break itself into t- pure transportation. In other words, a taxi, a module that you'll order, it'll come to the door and it'll take you somewhere, driverless perhaps. And also the ownership or the, or, or, or the being part of a car, whether you rent it or lease it or own it, but it's in the driveway. You know, it's for your everyday use. And I asked the question when somebody, um, and I know a few celebrities who are very particular what cars they drive up to their evening event in and uh, they're not they're not driving they're being driven and yet the car they're in still means a lot to them and so i think there will still be a need for that sense of individualism and that sense of character that uh, reflects the brand and, and the people who use them absolutely whether they're being driven or whether they're driving themselves um i think if people are going to purchase or lease a car or a vehicle of any kind that will still matter to them Otherwise, we just live in wooden boxes, wouldn't we? Yeah. Yeah. Will it create opportunities for interior design that we couldn't have imagined? Well, interior design, through through the time I was certainly in the industry, interior design became increasingly important, you know. um, And uh, certainly by the time I left, it was probably the most important part of any car. Once you got inside a car, you had to keep people there. and, And also, you have to keep them safe as well. So, yes, interior design has got a huge amount of opportunity. Uh, it's a place to be. And of course, the entertainment system is a place that is something else that's very much part of that. It's a place to be and a place to enjoy. And when we get to autonomous cars, it may also be a place to work. So, you know, it will replace a lot of other um, other uh, uh, destinations or indeed environments that you might otherwise uh, have somewhere else. So, yes, interior designs can become, is becoming much more uh, of an opportunity yeah definitely so if there's a 14 year old boy out there who's considering penning a letter to a car company and perhaps becoming a designer if you were on the other end of that how would you write the letter as a response <laughs> what would you say to that young individual well i would encourage them absolutely you know the world they're going into now is much more competitive and much more open than it than it certainly was when i was doing this and I would definitely encourage them. I'd also try and give them some advice how to, to go about getting into the business. But what I'd want to know from them, what I'd say to them is have a point of view. You know, I, I want to design cars because I wanted to design and create cars. You know, the, the, the net effect of that in my life was irrelevant to me at that point. I wanted to make things happen. I wanted to do things that didn't already exist. And I, you, have to, you have to pull that out of the individual. Is that what they really want to do? Or they just want to be a car designer. And so it's important to, to encourage people to have a point of view. You can change the point of view. You know, as you go through life, your, your points of view will change. But have a point of view and, and stick to it and, and have, have something to push against and to drive against. And I think it's very, very important, no matter what career you're in, but especially car design. You know, and I would hope that they have a sense of what style they want to chase um, what particular philosophy they want in, 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 in the motor car or transportation or whatever they choose to do. That is so important because without that, you don't have a, a driving force. And, and I say this because I meet so many car designers say, you know, they want to be a car designer and um, say, well, what do, you, what do you want to do with a car? And they, they kind of look at me dumbly and think, well, I just want to design cars. No, you don't. You need to be able to want to do something with them, you know? whether it be aesthetic or functionality or, or saving the planet, whatever it might be, have a point of view and stick to it until somebody persuades you otherwise. <laughs> they may well do. And they will. Finally, I ask 
Frank Stevenson this, this question, and I'll ask it to you, Ian Callum. How do you want to be remembered as a designer? <laughs> uh, reasonably good. <laughs> that's enough. That, that's your Scottish coming out, I think. <laughs> Understated. He, was, he, was, he wasn't bad. He wasn't bad. <laughs> he wasn't well, you were great on this program, Ian. It's so good to be with you Thank again. You. Thank you so much for spending time on Cars and Culture and uh, look forward to seeing you again soon. I hope so. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. The automobile is one of the most important inventions that revolutionized the modern world in America. The rich history of car culture runs deep as technology continues to shape the future of the industry. Jason Stein, former publisher of Automotive News, is here to share the stories of people passionate about cars, from industry leaders and innovators to car-obsessed celebrities. Buckle up as Jason takes you inside the boardroom, onto the track, and around the bend on Cars and Culture on Sirius XM Business Radio.